And I think this next conversation is another one that I really invited to the stage this year because beyond banking, ESG investing in public markets is the next layer that everyone touches through retirement accounts, through mutual funds. And the growth of this industry has been really impressive. But I think sometimes within the hardcore impact communities, people don't see the potential for impact as high in the public markets because it's not direct impact, because it's hard to influence those organizations. But the folks we're going to welcome to the stage speak for some of the largest financial institutions and have an insight into the ways that the ESG conversation is really evolving. And I think you'll find their conversation really interesting. So please welcome Mark Newberg, our moderator, Jackie Vanderbrug, and Andrew Lee. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Newberg. That's Andrew Lee, and that's Jackie Vanderbrook. There was a point, I mean, we're all friends. There was a point where I could do their titles just from memory, but the titles have evolved. <laughs> so um, Andrew is the head of sustainable and impact investing in the chief investment office of UBS Wealth Management. There are several words in the English language that are not in that title. Uh, and the inimitable Jackie Vanderbrook. Uh, is the head of sustainable and impact investment strategy for Bank of America. And I realize, Andrew, I didn't come up with an adjective for you. Uh, do you want to add one? Oh, I'm sure you can come up with ah, one. Maybe end of the I'll session, Mark. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're talking about ESG, or environmental, social, and governance factors, um, which you can think about that. And then I'm going to ask Jackie and Andrew um, to fix my definition, because they work with this on a daily basis. Um, things that are tied to the operational side of a business, and we tend to think about ESG as the public markets side of impact investing. And as I said backstage before we were coming out, we have about 25 minutes to get through $20 trillion in assets. Uh, so I don't know that we're going to cover it all, but it is a huge asset pool that if we want impact to scale and we ultimately want to combine doing good and doing well, we have to incorporate into our portfolio strategies. So Jackie, let me turn to you first. Let's start with what did I screw up in the definition of ESG? Well, I think it, you, know, you, you did it well, but um, it bears repeating. I, I regularly have people come back to me and say, what's that ESQ stuff that you keep talking mm -hmm. about? Um, and so it's important um, to have people actually think through um, these, what we have traditionally called non-financial factors, mm -hmm. right? That um, these factors are increasingly understood as material to, to note the conversations beforehand, long-term performance, mm -hmm. right? And so some of them being in that environmental aspect of things, some of them being more social, some of them being more governance, mm -hmm. but all of them being another look. Mm -hmm. um, the analogy that ends up working best with our clients is that of um, doctors in the X-ray. So I say to our clients, look, uh, when doctors got the X-ray, they didn't stop looking at um, people's skin or their eyes or their ears. They kept doing all of that. They just had additional information. So to me, ESG is that additional information about the DNA of a company um, that we use in addition to financial factors. And so, Andrew, how do you look at it? Because we've seen a dramatic increase in client demand for ESG, uh, and it informs how products are built and created. But what's the sort of where does ESG come in as an evaluative factor when you're thinking about putting something on the platform? Look, I, th I think Jackie's exactly right. When we think of ESG, I mean, our broad umbrella is sustainable investing, right? So ESG is just identifying the three factors that are additive to a typical investment process, right? So, you know, when we say ESG investing, to me, that doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? You can have mainstream <laughs> Can we stop saying right? ESG investing? Please, let's do it. Okay. Would you, Jackie, are you about to coin a term? Pardon me? Are you going to no, coin a term? Need any more no, I'm not going to coin a term. I just, that's one I don't love. So, so uh, I think it's, it's about stripping back, stepping back from all the terms and the definitions and everything that confuses people and just saying, look, 
what are our intentions as investors or what are our clients' intentions as investors um, and what are the solution sets that are out there and how do they actually deliver against that? And that could be mainstream strategies that are delivering S&P 500 or MSCI World type exposure, but where the portfolio manager has fully integrated ESG factors mm -hmm. or any one of those wear material. It could be, you know, exclusions where you have to recognize that there could be a performance impact, mm -hmm. but you are aligning with your value set. Um, and it could be, you know, impact. Warren was up here talking right now, you know, just now about uh, private equity impact types of mm -hmm. opportunities. And that's different. And you have ESG factors incorporated into portfolio companies, but you also have it incorporated into the strategy in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, what are we trying to achieve with regard to sustainable outcomes? And that's where I think that's the far end of the spectrum, as we call it, with regard to you're baking it into the strategy, it's not just a piece of the process. So I almost split it into two things, right? There's the, the process element of it, and then there's the strategy element of it. And I think the people who are really interested in sustainable investing and um, things that are beyond just exclusions think about that strategy piece and saying, why is something in my portfolio? Right. Which is perfect, because one of the things we talked about before settling on the design of this conversation was getting to the why behind these strategies. Because often we get up here and talk about what's being done. We don't get to the sort of why and how. So let's start with this then, Jackie. Why has ESG and why has sustainability become such a topic of conversation and I'd say asset movement in the last couple years? I mean, why now? So I think I, one piece of it is, I mean, there's, there's three pieces, right? So one piece is um, client demand. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, when, when you have eight of 10 of our clients saying that they believe companies should be responsible for their mm -hmm. actions, and five of 10 saying that they think that ESG factors should be used in investment, uh, you're in large numbers in mm -hmm. terms of client demand, and we know demographics are only gonna drive that further. Right? The second is the economy is changing, right? So, the, the way that the growth in intangible assets, the fact that now brand and intellectual property and things mm -hmm. that are much harder to measure with traditional financial factors um, are dominating the, the global economy, that's a huge piece. Mm -hmm. And then the third you can't forget is just the availability of data and the availability of portfolio construction tools. So part of this was that um, the sophistication of the development of both strategies and the use of those strategies in portfolios um, wasn't there. So put those three mm. things together, and yeah, we're talking about this. So, Andrew, global investment organization, uh, where, where, why now? Yeah, look, I wouldn't argue with anything that Jackie said. I think it's the recognition that um, increasingly, in order to look at the full picture of a company and think about long-term fundamental value and returns, you have to look at these non-financial factors, right? Jackie was alluding to the fact that tangibles versus intangibles as a percentage of whatever index you take has completely flipped over the last three decades, right? Eight, you know, three, three decades ago, it was 85% tangibles um, and a lot of machinery, equipment, hard assets, and it's completely flipped where it's, you know, 15% um, tangibles and 85% intangibles. So as a portfolio manager and investment analyst, if you're not looking at these things and incorporating them, wear material, of course, um, you're not getting the fullest picture of any given company. So you're starting to see that recognition from an investment perspective. We certainly believe it out of the chief investment office and all of the fund managers that we you know, work with I think are increasingly recognizing it to a different degree. Um, but... Uh, but you're seeing interesting products come on board. And, and now I would almost say there's a proliferation of products where we have to sort through them and say, mm -hmm. what actually belongs in a sustainable investing portfolio that actually achieves sustainable investing objectives or impact objectives? And what is more like a marketing strategy that's cloaked right. on top of... All right, you know, so th this is a really interesting thing. How do you make that determination? Because th these are conversations, that these have been going on for decades. All right. what, what's what's real, what's not. And Jackie, I saw you nodding when Andrew was talking about making that determination. How do you make that determination? Is so it Andrew God, and I were talking more? about this earlier today. Um, there's not a magic wand here, right? So um, on the great side of this, if the piece that I forgot, Mark, in my three things of like, why now? Part of the reason why now um, is that 
the research is now showing um, that it works, mm -hmm. right? Right. The, the increasingly when our um, lead equity analyst, uh, quant analyst, is saying that ESG is the best predictor of future earnings volatility she's seen in 20 years of being an equity analyst, and she's writing about that. Our advisors listen, like they, they yeah. think I'm interesting. They think Savita is the queen, I, right? I, like all, in, a, in an amazing way, right? So, so pa what, pause on that. So it's, there's now quant research saying this matters. It's not right. just it matters in terms of meaning, which is really important to all of us uh, and everybody watching, uh, but it also matters in a financially material way, and it's the merger of the two of them. Right, and it's also, I mean, the research has gone just beyond the, yes, um, you know, it, it can be a signal of volatility, but we've looked at that compared to traditional factors and said, you know, it's the least correlated factor, um, you know, so it, it's additional, whether you want to say to momentum or to growth or to some other factors that have worked. So from that standpoint, um, traditional investors are saying, okay, this is useful. But then Andrew and I have to say, well, but all of these investors aren't using this in the same way. And if we're actually trying to have truth in advertising um, to our clients, we need to say, this is a strategy that has used ESG factors um, you know, to reduce volatility by taking out bottom performers. Mm -hmm. And this is a strategy that is integrating ESG, but it's, you know, it's willing to, to invest in anything. And this is a strategy that's really using ESG and other outcome data um, to find those transformative businesses that uh, are solving the world's problems. And those are going to be differently useful um, to different clients and in different, in different portfolios. But there isn't a, a little sticker or a a quantitative way, right? It's a qualitative assessment plus some quantitative tools. Totally agree with that. I think it's about truth in advertising. Mm -hmm. You get back to what are we trying to achieve? What are the different types of outcomes you're trying to achieve? And can you properly label against that? Can you properly assess a strategy against that? So, you know, in our view, it's kind of two things. You go back to process and strategy, right? And there's a process that um, we have to assess the ESG-ness, if you will, and, you know, how ESG factors are incorporated. I don't think that's going to be the new tagline. No, it's not. But, you know, ESG factors and incorporating those into an investment process. How serious are you? How rigorous are you? How much have you built in terms of resources and, um, and capabilities around that? That's about your process, and that can apply to a mainstream strategy. That can apply to a deliberate sustainable investing strategy. And then there's the strategy part of it, which is, what is your strategy trying to achieve and being explicit about that? And so for us, the way that, you know, the approach that we've taken is really to build a portfolio and say, look, we'd like you to have different line items in your portfolio across equities and fixed income in the liquid space. And what do each of those exposures provide to you so that up front you have an expectation and then your portfolio either matches up to that or it doesn't in terms of the solution set that's in there. Right, so let's talk about the really interesting stuff, which I think is building strategies. Because um, we weren't having this conversation on stage 10 years ago. We weren't having it five years ago. This is now, this is, five years ago we were talking about impact getting to the mainstream. Now we are talking about the mainstream. Um, Jackie, you've been at the forefront of gender lens investing for more than a decade. Um, where does gender lens as a strategy fit into this conversation? And how, I'm asking two questions at once, how does building a strategy for this new public markets sector of impact work in real life? Mm -hmm. Those are two really big questions for the end of the day before drinks, Mark. <laughs> I, you didn't <laughs> sign up for the panel because you thought it was going to be easy. No, no. Um, so, uh, and they bookended my day. So, so here's the thing. I think that um, what a gender lens has done is pushed us as investors um, to continue to iterate towards um, more rigor and, and better investments, right? So the research similar to more generic research in ESG, there's been more and more research showing that um, companies that are more diverse from a gender standpoint are uh, better long-term investments, less volatile, 
you know, it, uh, and a whole set of other factors. Um, similarly, at the same time, we've had this um, understanding that gender equality is essential to the other things that impact investors are trying to get, right? So, you know, we're not going to get the rest of the SDGs accomplished uh, without SDG 5 integrating in. And I appreciate the, the Bain aspect of all of them are interrelated, right? That's, I think, what impact investors see very whole. But historically, I think people had seen gender equality as a, a vertical as opposed to seeing it as a horizontal. And um, some of the challenges, especially US-based challenges of the last uh, year and a half, have maybe shown us a little bit more in terms of the risks that we have when we don't use a gender lens, when we haven't thought about toxic cultures, um, when we haven't thought about our implicit biases and other kinds of things. So, I mean, just to come back to your question, mm -hmm. what role does gender equality play? Um, it, it forces additional rigor, mm -hmm. and you can then say, okay, you know, what was the gender lens, but now what's the racial and diversity lens that's forcing more rigor? What's the environmental lens that's forcing more rigor? And so it, the, the process that we've used in gender lens has now been replicated in mm -hmm. a number of other ways and I, that I think it, it's been helpful. And then the other piece is it's bringing in more investors, right? So we are now realizing that um, disproportionately women have said, wait a second, this is interesting to me. I want to pay it forward. I want to understand the role of my investments in creating gender equality. And we know, you know, again, it's not just, gender lens investing is not just for women, mm -hmm. uh, but women have the largest aspirational gap, right? Women have the largest gap between what they say they want to do in impact and what they're actually doing. And so if we don't start offering some products mm -hmm. that provide them different ways in making that happen, it's our loss. All right, so Andrew, let's talk about products. What's the, how does a product go from an idea to on your platform? <laughs> we laugh. Because, <laughs> because, it, uh, because there is no magic wand and you don't there snap is no your magic fingers wand. and it doesn't happen no, there is no uh, magic wand. in two months. There is no magic wand and we're not creating all the product out there. There are great fund houses that have done a lot to create strategies on their own, whether it's in gender or other thematics or, you know, with engagement focus and so forth. So part of it is the process of coming onto our platform and whether we think about um, how they match up against a sustainable investing framework, again, achieving the certain outcomes that an investor is looking to do. You know, when we think about co-creation, which is something we have been thinking about for a while, we want to achieve a specific objective. So, right, gender lens is a good example. Another example is engagement in public markets. So I think what's exciting is the ability to really use engagement to drive, uh, you know, impact in public markets. And I think this is a debate that's been going on for a while. Private markets is a little bit clearer. You have control in many cases. You're adding capital to situations that might not otherwise have it. Um, so you can talk about all the traditional things we talk about, intent, right, measurement, additionality. But it's harder to do in public markets. And I think that one of the exciting places that people have done for a long time, but where you're starting to see a lot more focus, whether it's around the SDGs or specific themes, is products that really focus on driving that additional engagement, quantifying it over time, and committing to hold uh, investments for longer periods of time so that you can actually say, look, I've owned this in a portfolio over time, and here's what the incremental impact is, as opposed to reporting on the underlying metrics that a company says they're doing, and then in a week or two weeks or four months or whatever it is, saying it's not in the portfolio anymore. So how can you credibly track impact over time if that's your portfolio? So I think that's one of the issues in public markets, and yet it's one of the opportunities if you have these dedicated engagement strategies to really drive incremental impact. But you have to be measuring it, and you have to have a committed portfolio that says this is what the, the purpose, right? Back to that strategy question. This is why we've created this portfolio, mm -hmm. and we're going to measure it and report on it for you. And so what do you, what do you both want to see from, let's take this to the company level, because companies go into funds and we're talking about ESG being an operational framework that's now being applied at the company level. Uh, there's been pressure from analysts to companies to do this. What do you want to see from a company? Does it depend on the sector the company's in? Are there a set of things you want to know about, like you know, wages, healthcare, um, environmental efficiency? What is it? Energy efficiency. Or is it you know it when you see it and it's different by industry? So, um, 
Or did Mark I'll, just ask uh, a really so, stupid so, question? So, so, no, no, no. So the, the answer, I think, is twofold, right? So part of it is your piece. It, it does differ by industry, mm -hmm. right? So it is that aspect of, um, you know, you're much more interested in the performance of water recycling for a utility than you are for a financial services mm -hmm. company. Um, I think that in general, we're much more interested in performance data than in policy data, mm -hmm. right? So historically, ESG was much more about do you have a XYZ policy? And increasingly, it's what kind of goals do you have and how far are you, you know, what kind of process can you show towards those goals? That's harder to mm -hmm. actual do apples to apples for it, you know, so that's where the art of being a portfolio manager comes in. And what do you think? No, I, I agree with that. I think that um, what I'd point out is it, it has to come from the right place, right, in terms of you're not reporting metrics simply to report metrics. So when you go to investor day, what are people asking you? And we'll report on that. That's fine. I think it has to come from an understanding of what's material to your business model and what's actually important that you want to achieve, whether it's through CSR um, or whether it's through your actual operations. And so I think that's what should drive increased focus on ESG at the corporate level, together with an understanding that that's what's important to investors increasingly as a piece of the investment process. But Mark, yeah. just because this goes back to the very beginning setup, you know, that the community here has historically been less interested um, in the impact in public markets. And I'll say, you know, my background coming from being part of, you know, starting the Good Capital Fund and being in private markets, I was the same way. I was less interested in public markets. Living inside a large public company now, I do see the systemic nature, right? So um, the role of ESG to our, um, our investor relations team has transformed in the last three years. Um, you know, our head of ESG is linked at the hip to our, our IR head, right? They go regularly together. That was not happening five years ago. And when there's a new ETF launch, there's an immediate question of are we in it or are we not? And if not, what would we have to do to get there? So I think it's really hard to measure the, you know, specific impact of some of this, but the systemic impact is really clear. Mm -hmm. And has the demand increased because stakeholders are saying, we want this? Is it because the research data shows reductions in risk and volatility, or is it a combination of everything and the financial community and the investor community sort of coming together and saying, we got to use the public markets to drive some of the impact we want to see? I think it's a combination. Um, I think it's an understanding uh, on investors' parts that they do care about. They, they have preferences. And I think in the past, people had said, well, I don't think that's germane to investing uh, for return. And now increasingly, you're seeing that there are opportunities to invest for return and also do something, whether it's aligning you know, to values, whether it's um, actually in, in, integrating ESG factors into your investing or you know, creating more deliberate impact. Um, I think there is that realization. So it's a confluence, I think, of people are genuinely interested in how their capital is impacting broader people and planet and how can they put that into their portfolios. And I think, again, it comes back to a recognition of what can you do and what can't you do in public markets. Um, and I think as long as we're realistic about those expectations going in, then I think we're fine you know, a year down the road or five years down the road. And that's a good segue to the last question because we're almost out of time. Um, what do you want to see in the future? We talked about what you want to see from a company. We talked about what you want to see from a fund. What do you want to see in the future? If we're back here five years from now having this conversation, what, what will feel like success? You wanted a philosophical question. You like philosophical questions. So uh, I guess three things. We haven't talked about advisors at all mm -hmm. today, but um, uh, the, the top three things that get investors in our research to move are, are performance, um, proof of impact, and if their advisor talks about it. Uh, and so, you know, what I want to see five years from now is that this is a much more um, natural muscle for our advisors. Mm -hmm. 
that they're able to, you know, integrate this into their practice in a way that enables them to build stronger relationships, um, you know, but also to have, have more impact on the world. The other thing is we've got to figure out how to um, have flexible products that are um, more useful in multi-asset class portfolios. So a lot of our, our products right now are a little uh, esoteric. Andrew? Yeah, I think I've got 10 seconds, so I would say um, agree with everything you said about advisor adoption and advisor interest, um, greater client interest and adoption, which ultimately means more capital into the space. And the last piece of it is a real focus on measuring the impact and trying to credibly report on it so that five years from now, mm -hmm. we actually do understand what was accomplished and what wasn't accomplished, both in public markets and in private markets. And I will say, I would love for corporate executives and fund managers and board members to have a clear picture of the difference between operational and aspirational and drive it getting ESG to the operational parts that help make the business a better, more successful, more sustainable business. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks.